Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It's good to worship with you, to be back with you. We had a, a great time, um, refreshing time, relaxing time, uh, rejuvenating time, um, re-energizing time, whatever, um, for a little while. Uh, it is good to be back and to be worshiping with you. A few things to announce to you today. First of all, um, I, I noticed a little note from Deb in the bulletin on her thanks. Julie and I want to say thank you to each of you um, who uh, you know, did something uh, special towards us for Christmas. We appreciate it so much. Um, in the way of announcements today, um, <clears throat> there is a clipboard is supposed to be going through the congregation. We have a community meal Tuesday evening. Carol, what is on the menu? Scallop and green beans and cornbread. Okay, and so you're asking the congregation on the clipboard to bring <laughs> salads or? Yeah, it, it, okay, so that'll be passed through. If you care to provide a dish, sign up and bring it on Tuesday. Uh, love to have you uh, participate in that with us. The community kind of shows up and a lot of our people show up and it's a good good evening of fellowship and food and so encourage you to be a part of that. As soon as the service, oh yeah. I also need help. Oh, you do. Okay, so there's a place for helpers to sign up. Okay, so as that goes around, there's all for food and then for help, all right? We, uh, you don't think you can just do it by yourself? No, not. Okay, <laughs> totally understand. All right, uh, as soon as the service is over today, uh, we are gonna take down all the green stuff that you see, the trees and the decorations on the pew. There is a system that's in place. Uh, there are a few people who know what that system is, so as they tell you what to do, my advice is to follow that and it goes real smoothly. Um, and uh, we will have that done uh, rather quickly. So please, if you're able and willing after the service to help us out, please stay. And then finally, uh, those on the session who are part of the operations group, we are meeting Tuesday evening at 6.30, okay? 6.30 is the time of our meeting, and um, uh, hope that you can be there for that. Is there anything else that needs to be announced today? With that said, we're beginning a new year of worship, and so I would ask that you would take just a moment <coughs> and sanctify this time and this space, dedicated to God's Spirit working with us, uh, speaking to us, uh, taking what we offer to God and making it acceptable on our behalf. So if you take just a moment and pause and silent your heart, maybe offer a prayer to God. Um, let's begin our worship.
Christ our Savior has come, born in the manger at Bethlehem. So in light of that, join me in the call to worship. Arise, shine, your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory has appeared to all of the earth with the birth of his Son. All of you who would praise him, prepare your hearts to offer your worship. All of you who would find him, prepare your souls to seek him out. And all of you who would listen to him, prepare your minds to encounter the truth. O oh, come, let us worship the Lord, and consider what wondrous things God has done. Praise God for the gift of the Son. Let us lift up our many voices and praise the God who has brought salvation to all people. Amen. Welcome from God the Father, who gave Jesus, born in Bethlehem, as the fulfillment of his faithful promise to his people. Amen. May the peace that comes with this gift of God's faithful promise be with you in abundance. And also with you. Today we join with generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmists. Today's reading is Psalm 72. Give your love of justice to the King, O God, and righteousness to the King's Son. May the mountains yield prosperity for all, and may the hills be faithful, fruitful. He will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. He will redeem them from oppression and violence, for their lives are precious to him. Praise the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does such wonderful things. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the Lord be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. The word has become flesh and dwelt among us. Our God is not distant from us. Our God has embraced our weaknesses and shared in our sorrows. Let us then draw near to God's throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us pray together. We testify to the chosen servant of God who has come to heal us. The word has become flesh 
and dwelt among us. He spoke the words that we couldn't speak. We saw the will of God that we ignored. He heard the voice of God that we silenced. He walked the way of God that caused us to be stumbled. He delighted in the will of God that we betrayed. He offered the riches of God that we squandered. He healed the brokenness of our lives that we could not fix. He provided the forgiveness of God that we could not afford. The one we have waited for has come with healing in his wings. Thanks be to God through Jesus the Incarnate One. Amen. Let's take a few moments now for silent prayer and reflections. The miracle of God's love for us is shown to us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was truly God, did not seek to remain equal with God, but instead gave up everything, becoming a slave when he became like one of us. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Please is many press through the church. Whether we live or die, we seek to bring honor to Christ. Let us take a moment now and share the peace with each other. Surely Jesus is more than an heirloom to us, isn't he?
Thank you, Mary. So good to have her with us today. Would you bow your heads and let us pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture, words penned long ago, stories that were told, oral traditions that were passed on, written down for our benefit. Today we peek into one of those traditions. Help us to see. Give us eyes that we can see and ears that we can hear and hearts that we can understand the things that you have for us. For it is in the name of our Savior Jesus that we pray. Amen. Well, our text today comes to us from Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to read the first 12 verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. And when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled. <clears throat> and all of Jerusalem was troubled with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and they worshiped him. And then opening their treasuries, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you know, it's, it's a strange thing uh, coming to you from traditions outside of our tradition here. Uh, I grew up in a church world uh, for most of my adult life that never really did much with the church calendar or the church seasons. But as I've gotten older and have gotten immersed into it, I really see the beauty of it. We just had Christmas. It's a distant memory, although we still have some of the remnants of it around here. But the season that we are partaking of now, that'll take us for a few weeks, is a season that we call Epiphany. It has significant importance. Epiphany basically says to us, okay, Jesus is born. So what? It asks us to ponder what has happened. It asks us to see not just a babe in a manger, but to see beyond the baby into what God is doing. Epiphany, by its own definition, is the revealing of something, the coming out of something. It is defined as a sudden appearance or manifestation, of something that's related to God. It is the premise of our faith, and this is really important for you, it is the premise of our faith as Christians that God has fully, completely, and clearly revealed who he is in the person of Jesus Christ. In other words, when we try to understand the God who made all things, the God who is beyond all things, the God who bears all things and who has not only made it, but keeps it going and fashions it and brings it to a purpose, who is beyond our understanding, our premise as Christians is that God can only be known 
when we look at the person of Jesus Christ. What Jesus does is of the Father. He says, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. And so this whole thing of seeing Jesus, the whole idea of epiphany, having a, a revealed look at Jesus, is really important, and we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at that. It's always interesting that when we see God reveal something, it's never really what we expect. That's kind of everything with God. God always works in ways that are different than what we kind of expect. We have this linear thing that we think everything should be on, and then God interrupts that, and he does something unique. Or maybe we're on a trajectory where we think everything is, should be this way and then something over here happens and then lo and behold, we find God in the midst of that. That's kind of the way the story of the text is today. It is interesting that in all three of the other Gospels, the coming out party of Jesus or the revealing of Jesus, who is now the revelation of God the Father, but that coming out had to do with the baptism of Jesus. So when Jesus comes and is baptized and the voice from heaven speaks and says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, that is how the other gospel writers all choose to introduce Jesus. But Matthew chooses a different way. He represents a different tradition. His presentation of who Jesus is is told in the story of the Magi. Instead of a baptism, Matthew chooses to introduce who Jesus is through three, what we call three, we really don't know how many. There could have been, I think some traditions say there were as many as 12. But through these Magi, these astrologers, these strange creatures from the Far East, from Persia, probably what we would call Iran, Iraq today, maybe even a little farther east, who have come to see Jesus. And in, the, in that, Matthew reveals who Jesus is. Now let's just talk just a little bit about Matthew. What is he? Matthew is one of the writers of the gospel from a different tradition than the other traditions. He is the Jewish writer. When you read the Gospel of Matthew, one thing you will notice all the time is that Matthew, every time he tells us a story, he says, as it is written, and then he quotes something from the law or something from the prophet. Because Matthew is interested in allowing the Jewish people to understand the Jewishness of Jesus. So Matthew tells the story of Jesus, and in some sense, Jesus is like the embodiment of Israel. After when Jesus uh, grows up, Jesus goes and he's baptized in the Jordan, similar to parting through the Red Sea. He then is thrust into the wilderness, like Israel went into the wilderness. And then the very first thing Matthew has Jesus do is he ascends on a mountain and there he preaches, there he proclaims what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew takes all of these teachings of Jesus that the other writers distribute all throughout the ministry of Jesus. He gathers them into one, very similar to Moses going up on the mountain and receiving the revelation of God. Jesus goes up on the mountain and he proclaims the re revelation of God. His genealogy is a Jewish genealogy. He sets Jesus as a Jewish character, and so it's really fascinating to me that the most Jewish of all of the Gospels reveals Jesus through non-Jewish means. The Magi are Gentiles, and they are, the, in Matthew's account, the first to discover Jesus. It is interesting that at the very beginning of Matthew's gospel, he tells us the end result of what the gospel will be. And that is that the Gentiles will come, and they will proclaim that Jesus is king, and they will worship Jesus, which has come to pass. So Matthew, right at the very beginning of his very Jewish story, brings the Gentiles into play. And there, among the Gentiles, Matthew has them understand who Jesus is. It's interesting because at the very end of Matthew's Gospel, it is a Roman centurion who proclaims when Jesus dies, truly this is the Son of God. 
So it's fascinating how the gospel, like I say, when God reveals himself, it's always kind of this, wow, I didn't know that. If we're never, if we, if we don't continue to be amazed by what God says or what God speaks, something's wrong with us. So here's this Jewish writer with a Jewish gospel telling us Gentiles understand who Jesus is. And what's interesting is nobody of the Jewish people understand who Jesus is. It's a fascinating thing, because Matthew is going to reveal Jesus in a very unique way. He tells us the end of the story at the very beginning. When I was a kid, growing up, I find myself going back there more and more. I think that's part of being, you know, on the backside of 60. But I remember, specifically, that every year, I don't know when I started realizing this, but every year, the very first week of the new year, the National Enquirer, that, that standard of truth, that bastion of reality, would publish Jean Dixon's predictions for the coming year. Do you all remember that? She would, her face would be plastered on the Enquirer. It'd be right there at the shopping, uh, at the grocery store when mom was getting her groceries and you'd go to check out. And here would be the National Enquirer staring at you with Jean Dixon's pic, uh, picture and 10 most shocking predictions for the coming year. And I'd find myself looking at that and my mom would come over and she would kind of tap me or smack me and say, we're Christians, we don't do that. That's not for us. But it was fascinating. The world was kind of caught up in it. But as Christians, we weren't. It was forbidden. God had spoken in the word that we weren't to look to astrology to be guided. It was to be God and God's spirit that was to guide us. And yet that is exactly who Matthew tells the story of the revealing of Jesus through. The Magi were the Gene Dixons of the day. They read the stars. They tried to interpret the astrological significance of what is going on and then apply it out into the world. They weren't Jewish at all. They were part of a forbidden practice of a long lost people that were outside of what God was doing in the nation of Israel. It's almost sacrilegious. It'd be like adding Homer Simpson to our nativity set out in the church lawn. It's just unthinkable. Magi? If you were a Jewish reader of a Jewish gospel from Matthew and you recognize that these astrologers from a far eastern land were the ones that recognized Jesus as the Messiah, you would probably say, no, wait a minute. Something's wrong here. This doesn't seem right. But their story is incredible. They see a star. And they interpret the star as a sign that a new king has been born in Judea. Now this is sometime after the birth narrative, and even though our Christmas pageants always include the wise men, this is sometime later. We don't really even know where Jesus is. They're sent to Bethlehem, but it's the star who guides them, and they don't go to the manger, they go to a home. This is anywhere from days later to possibly as much as two years. So they see this star. The interpreter is a sign that a king is born. And they travel to Jerusalem expecting to find a celebration. After all, any time there is a new male heir that is born that will become the king, there is cause for great celebration. Kings would walk proudly out with their son and display it to the crowds and everyone would cheer because this would be the future king. What a puzzling sight it must have been for them to arrive in Jerusalem and everything's quiet. There isn't a hint of celebration anywhere. Jerusalem is totally unaware that anything significant has happened, which is phenomenal in the story if you think about it. The one thing Israel is all about 
is the long anticipated and waited for Messiah. It was the longing of the people of God for the Messiah to come and make everything right. And Messiah has come and no one is aware of it. <laughs> Except these astrologers from the East. So they naively, and I think it borders on almost fascinating, not just naive, but dumb. They go into Herod and they say, hey, we're looking for the new king. Now, if, if nobody's celebrating the new king and you go into the king and you say, hey, there's been a new king born, what do you think the results of that might be? Your successor's been born. We're looking for him. And Herod goes, what? Now Herod is one of the most paranoid figures in history. He clings to power through his alliance with Rome. He's made deals and trade-offs with Rome. He is married into a Hasmonean family, but he is not Jewish. He is an Edomite. So his hold of the people is very tenuous. Some kind of a mixed breed, a Samaritan type figure. And he's paranoid and he's, he's, he's taken aback by the question. And so he assembles all the chief priests, all the religious people of Jerusalem, the chief priests and the scribes, the ones who are responsible for writing out the text. He says, a new king has been born. Why didn't you tell me? Where is this king? What's going on here? And so they're scrambling. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're making up for lost time. They're reading through the scriptures, the pages of scripture, and they come across the passage from Micah that says out of Bethlehem will arise this Messiah. So Herod comes back to the wise men or to the magi and he says to them, our sacred writing suggests that he's in Bethlehem. Would you do me a favor? Would you go, find him, come back and let me know where he is so that I can go and pay my honor? What a shrewd snake. Obviously hoping to kill him. So they head out, the star takes him to over the place where Jesus is, directs them to the home, and there they discover this child. And they bring these precious gifts when they see him. And the scriptures say they worship him. Isn't that ironic that Matthew's account, the that the Gentiles are like the first prominent people to worship Jesus. When they're done, God warns them not to go back to Herod, and so they go a different way, and they go back home. Herod is so livid that he slaughters the children surrounding Bethlehem, all those who are two years old and under, which is very reminiscent again in Matthew's account of Moses, remember Moses' story. All the babies in Egypt that were born to the Israelites were slaughtered. It's part of the Christmas story we never really talk about. It's what the Bible says that Rachel is weeping for her children. It's a fascinating story. What are some of the things that maybe we can observe from the text that are maybe scriptural type things? Let me, let me just share a couple. I find it interesting that the insiders of the faith have no clue to what God is doing. It is outsiders who are the informed and who are the worshipers. What can we draw from this? That's a really important question in my world. 
as I look for those who are trying to navigate the hostile landscape, the toxic landscape of our world today, and try to show us the faith. Who is hearing from God? Who represents God? In our story, it is not the chief priests and the scribes. It is not Herod. It is not Jerusalem. It's something totally outside. Can we see God doing something outside of what we're comfortable with? Or outside of our expectations? Somebody asked Mother Teresa one time, how is it that every day, every day, you can wake up and you can take care of these orphans and these lepers and these people who are dying every day face death? Every day be among those whose suffering and pain is overwhelming. She says, because every day I'm not among the suffering whose pain is overwhelming, I'm among Jesus. Because Jesus is here. She saw God doing something outside of what we would think God was doing. Secondly, I think God's appearing is not evident to most. And it has to be sought out. The, the, the Magi see this star and they understand it and they follow it. They make a commitment to it. It's not just apparent. All of Israel is blinded to this most amazing event that they had all longed for and waited for. The whole substance of their faith was embodied in this person. And they don't see it. But here's these figures who see something and commit to it and they chase after it and they want it and they, they pursue it. I think also from the text it's interesting what they presented to Jesus. Gold and frankincense and myrrh. Because the three gifts are Matthew telling us who Jesus is. Gold is a gift to royalty. Incense is a gift offered to deity. And myrrh is something that is afforded to mortality. Myrrh is associated with death. Here is Jesus who is king, who is God, who is human, who will die. I also think the text shows us that Herod is the epitome of human power. Everything about human power is about preserving power and justifying any means that it takes to keeping it. Just observe what goes on in our political world. Two parties in our nation fighting for power, neither giving an inch. Totally dedicated to winning whatever it is, the battle. And who gets lost in all of it? The people they are called to serve. Herod didn't care about Jesus. Herod didn't care about the Magi. Herod didn't care about Israel. He didn't care that God was coming and doing something amazing in the nation that had been the hope of the nation. All he was concerned about is, how can I preserve my position? How can I preserve my power? How can I get through my agenda? How can I make everybody notice me? Our text points it out so clearly. And maybe the thing that is the most depressing in the text is that the idea that when religion is affiliated with politics, it becomes a destructive force. I find it so interesting that the chief priests and the scribes, the leaders of the people of Israel, the religious people who are to help the people of God on their journey spiritually, and who are to show the people the things of God, that group of people willingly gave up the location of the Messiah to Herod in order to preserve their own place and status. Everything that as a nation they had hoped for, everything that they represented, they willingly sacrificed. Herod, you want to know where he is? There he is. And we're willing to send someone to take out the Messiah in order to keep everything as it was.
Matthew is brilliant in his text. The whole statement of Jesus, the whole narrative of Jesus is about the contrast to earthly power. Think about it. Herod and his power, the religious people and their power, all these people of power, and here's Jesus born of humble means, born associated with a stable, humble birth, celebrated by the most humble of occupations and shepherds, discovered by magi. Nothing about Jesus speaks of power, and yet Jesus has power. He had it because he laid it down. So let me just give you a couple things maybe you can take with you today in your own life. I think this text calls us to expect God to work in the unexpected. I gotta tell you, sometimes that's in painful situations. While I was on vacation, I attended the funeral of the 26-year-old girl who died. And was, mom and dad are very dear friends of Julie and I. Everybody's asking the question, why? And yet God is doing something in the lives of the parents, not what they wanted and not what they expected, but there's something going on in their lives that is unique, and God is doing something with that. I think the text also says to us, maybe we need to be more open to diversity. Be more welcoming of those who are on us, not like us. If Jesus is the birth of Emmanuel, God with us, who is the us? It is the Magi. Well, that didn't fit into my box. Magi don't wear ties and jackets to church. They're outside of what we all want and expect and we're comfortable with. But perhaps we should expect that. And maybe, finally, is to expect that you should find yourself, if you're truly a follower of Jesus, to be outside of what is popular or normal or easily defined. One of my favorite follows on Twitter is a Presbyterian pastor by the name of Scott Sauls. He pastors Christ Presbyterian in Nashville. Amazing church, amazing man of God. Every day he tweets out different things and every one of them rock me to my core. Because Saul, Scott Saul decides to be different and he challenges me to be different to not be popular, to not accept the norm, and not be easily defined. He said in one of his tweets, Jesus' vision is that his followers love their enemies even more than their enemies love each other. Boy, try that out in our world. Love our enemies more than they love each other. He says, Christians who say Democrats are the answer, why your silence and ambivalence towards the unborn? And Christians who say they're Republicans, they say Republicans are the answer, why your silence and ambivalence towards those who are seeking refuge? A boldly partisan Christian in all of its forms is a contradiction in terms. How about this one? The top three most essential virtues for a Christian are, you ready? Ready for these? Humility, humility, humility. How far does that get you in our normal, popular, well-defined world? He says every Christian who follows Jesus in the teachings is too conservative for liberals and too liberal for conservatives. Why is the Bible so relevant, he says, because it shows no interest in being relevant. And finally, my favorite one. If you expect to find yourself outside of what is popular or normal or easily defined, he says, define yourself as one who is dearly beloved of God. This is who you really are. 
every other identity you have is only an illusion. Story of the Magi. An amazing story. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture, for that which is spoken to us, the challenges that it brings. Help us, Lord, as we now try to live that which we have been taught and receive that which has been spoken. Help us to be different. In Jesus' name, amen. of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Mary comes forward and our ushers get ready. We will receive our morning offering.
join me in our prayer for our offering. For all that you have given to us, for all you have done, we are most grateful. Receive our offering of thanks in our hearts of love and devotion. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we find ourselves so caught up in so many things. We are busy with this. Our attention is in that. We carve out time and space to be busy, to be active. And in the process, we don't see. As the words of the hymn said, may it be that we come to a place where we don't need a star to guide us. But we see you. And we see what you're doing. And you see what we see what you call us to be. Our prayers that you open our eyes. As we offer up our prayers today, we are mindful of those around us who are struggling, those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are dealing with being aged and are approaching their passage into the next life. As we're mindful of these, we offer their names up before your throne as we now present them. especially mindful today of Harold Baddicher, Bruce and Shelley, those, Father, who are part of our lives, who are struggling. Open their eyes that they might see you in their time of need. Grant to all of us open hearts. Help us to see who Jesus really is. These things we pray in his name, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May we be a people who see our God for all that he is. And may he be near to each of us. Go in peace, for we are. Amen.